anymore. Again, it's good that you're out here on a Wednesday night. Joshua chapter 3 and 4. I've been, we've been in Joshua chapter 3 and 4 for the last, what, couple, two or three Sundays. I mean, uh, Wednesdays, excuse me. All right, um, Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. Um, we start off by reading the first four verses. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and they removed from Shittim and came to Jordan, he and all the children of Israel. And they lodged there before they passed over. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host and they commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests of the Levites bearing it, then shall, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. All right, now we're talking about going forward, going forward by faith, stepping out by faith and going forward. In Exodus chapter number 14, verse number 15, um, we find that they were standing there by the Red Sea and um, they couldn't go forward because of um, uh, the, the Red Sea. They couldn't go behind because of the Egyptian army. God said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then after it was all said and done, speak to the people that they what? that they go forward according to Exodus chapter number 14, verse number 15. They go forward. They go forward. So we step out by faith and go forward. In the Christian life, we're to go forward. God didn't save us to make us statues. He saved us to make us soldiers, to go forward by faith. Amen? Forward by faith. All right, now in Joshua chapter number 3 and Joshua chapter number 4, God illustrates for us three essentials for moving ahead by faith and claiming all that God has for us. First of all, we have the word of faith, the word of faith. The Bible talks about, uh, uses the Bible as the word of faith. And he, uh, what is it? Romans chapter number 10, verse number eight. The Bible is called the word of faith. Well, right here in Joshua chapter number three, we see the word of faith. That's one essential. Then we see the walk of faith is the second essential for moving ahead. And then we see the witness of faith there in chapter number four. Chapter three is in two parts, the word of faith, the walk of faith, and chapter number four of Joshua is the witness of faith. Now, here as we're looking at Joshua chapter number three in the first 13 verses, and I'm going pretty fast because we really have preached on Joshua chapter three for the last two or three Wednesday nights. So hopefully you can get you a copy of the tape or you can see it on YouTube and you can put it all together. We do have our sermons videotaped and they're on YouTube and we have people all over the country, actually all over the world watching uh, our sermons. So, so put these all together. If you, if you wasn't here and you would like to get a CD, then you can do that as well. We'll fix you up a CD. But anyway, in Joshua chapter number three, Joshua didn't ask the people to swim for the river was at flood stage. How do I know that? Look at verse number 15 of Joshua chapter 3. And as they, as they that bear the ark were coming to Jordan and the feet of the priest that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. And then if you'll notice in parentheses, what does it say? For Jordan overfloweth all of its banks all the time of the harvest. So this was indeed a miracle. You know, there's some people that like to discredit the word of God. They say that uh, God drowned the Egyptian army in two feet of water at the Red Sea. There's a narrow place at the Red Sea. And I said all the much more miracle that God drowned an entire army in two foot of water. Amen. Isn't that something? And then we get to Joshua and he crossed the Jordan and the Bible says it was during uh, the harvest season when it was at flood stage. So it wasn't just a little trickle of water. And by the way, I've been to the Jordan when the dry spell and it's still pretty deep. Um, we went over there and um, uh, of course, I had to go in Jordan and I had to get baptized. You say, what good did it do you? Not a bit. Just to say I've done it. Amen. Uh, just to say I've done it. Fact is, I tried to use that. I think I've told you this before. I tried to use that, that I followed the Lord in baptism so I wouldn't have to go back to church and tell the folks there, you know, that I'd got saved uh, after I'd already made a profession. You know, y'all know that my testimony, don't you? 
Uh, most of you do anyway. You know, I got saved later on. I didn't get saved when I made a profession of faith. I really got born again later on. And so I didn't want to go back to the church. And so I thought, now I'll just use that Jordan River baptism as my, as my uh, step of obedience. But what I had to do is come back and, and confess Christ and then follow the Lord and believers' baptism. I had to do I had to. You, somebody asked me, did you have to do that? Yes, I did. I didn't have to to go to heaven, but I had to follow the Lord and believe his baptism. So what happened? What happened when you first got back? Well, I just came up wet. That's it. See, the significance of water baptism. Anyway, I don't know how I got on that. The Jordan River is how I got on that. Amen? It was at flood stage. Uh, so, so anyway, the, the Joshua didn't ask him to swim for the rivers at flood stage. And there was no boats and there was no rafts so they there was over a million people and so like Moses before him Joshua received his orders from the Lord the Bible tells us that's where we receive our orders in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 quote it with me so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God Living faith will always lead to action. Amen. Did you get that? Living faith, I don't know if I'm going to take the word always out or not, but it will lead to action. Otherwise, you have a dead faith. It leads to action. What is faith? It's a response to the truth of God. A response to the truth of God. Now, I didn't say that a person has to go out here and do a lot of work in order to, to uh, uh, say that he's in order for to, to go to heaven. But I do say this, that a person's going to go out here and serve, the, and serve the Lord because he's created in Christ Jesus unto good works to understand properly James chapter 2. That's what you, is that where you were going? That's where I'm going. I, I knew it. I knew you was, Brother Donnell. I knew you were going there. Turn over to James chapter 2, if you will. James chapter 2. Now, I made a statement. Living faith will lead to action. It should lead to action. I think I put the word always in there. I'm not going to put the word always in there because I don't want to confuse you. Can a person be saved and die and go to heaven without any good works? I'm asking you. Think about what I just said. If salvation is by grace through faith, then if I add anything to by grace through faith, then it ceases to be by grace through faith. Doesn't it? Yes, sir. But if you wanted to actually apply faith in life, you would do something. Well, that's what James does. You see, there's a, there's, a, um, there, there's a vertical faith, as Brother Donnell put it, a vertical and horizontal. Vertical faith, it's, it's, it's a faith that God gives me. I didn't muster it up. Faith comes by hearing and hearing how? By the word of God. When, my, when I'm enlightened, I place my faith in Christ, in God's word, and my soul is saved. God comes in and imputes to me the righteousness. But then if I'm going to show, if I tell other people I'm saved and don't do anything, what are they going to say? I don't believe you. Yes, sir. Vertical justification. Well, so look at verse, look at chapter 2. Are you over there? In chapter 2 of James. Uh, look at verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is what? It's dead. So, the Bible said that you're justified by faith without works in the book of Romans. And then it says in James chapter 2, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. Which one's right? Both are right. Both are right. Justification by faith in Romans. And in order to be justified before men, men need to see what? They need to see good works. The Bible says in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect? 
You have people that try to preach a work salvation that will take James chapter number two and say that you have to work to go to heaven or work to keep your salvation. James chapter number two is not speaking about a work salvation. James chapter number two is 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 telling us what man should do after salvation so that the world can see that there's a God in heaven. Let your light so shine before men that they may see what? If they see your good works, who are they going to glorify? Your Father in heaven. If they don't see good works, what's going to happen? They're not going to glorify your Father in heaven. If I tell you I'm saved, you say, Brother Rowan, let me see you're saved. That's all you have. That's all you have. Now, God knows the heart. I don't know the heart. You don't know the heart. So our good works are manifest to glorify our Father which is in heaven. And if you'll notice in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 10, we're created in Christ Jesus unto what? After your, most, your, your two most famous verses in the Bible. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved how? Through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, who's right, James or Ephesians? Both. Both's right. And then verse 10, immediately after that, says, for we are created in Christ Jesus unto... How does it go, Brother Donnell? We're created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before that we should walk in them. So you'll find that in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 10, okay? All right. No, go ahead. Okay. That's all right. I've been known to be rrr before. You know, the young, the young crowd just doesn't even understand that. They don't understand that, do they? They'd have to be back in the 70s and watch Happy Days. Yeah, they'd have to know Fonzie to understand that one, wouldn't they? All right. I, I take too many illustrations from TV. I need to quit that. I know it. That's, that's liberal, isn't it? That's liberal. That's compromising. All right. Anyway, I've known to have been rrr sometimes. You know? So, well, all right. So... Anyway, we see in James chapter number two that we're justified by works and then we see that salvation is justification by faith. Uh, and, God, and here's the good part about it. Again, God gives us that faith. People don't realize that. They say you're justified by faith and you need faith to please God. Well, maybe I don't have enough faith. Maybe you just need to read the word of God more. If you will, again, if you will continue to seek Christ, who are you going to find? You're going to find Christ. How do I know that? Because the Bible said the very word that produces faith says so. So if I want enough faith to believe Christ, I need to get in the word of God. And I believe Christ. first. Now, if you're here and you've never been born again, stay in the word of God. Stay in the word of God. And I hope tonight I didn't confuse you. But James is not contradicting Paul in the book of Romans. James is right on target. And uh, it's our it's our works toward so that men can see it's our justification before men men justify us by our good works god justifies you by what by faith all right i got that okay now anyway we see the word of faith in joshua chapter number three um living faith will lead to action now there's five messages right here in Joshua chapter number three. Five messages in Joshua chapter number three. You have the officer's message to the people there in the first four verses. And since they had not been this way before, they needed God to guide them. They need, I need God to guide me. I need to go forward, but I need a clear, I need God to give me the direction. So how do I find the directions? I get in the Word of God. God produces and gives me what I need to go through today and to tomorrow as well. Amen. I need God to guide us. Now, in verse number four, we've already really pretty well explained this pretty much. They were not to get too close to the ark, for this was a holy piece of furniture and, uh, from the tabernacle, and it was not to be treated carelessly. And so there's a lesson we learn from that, that... God is our companion, and by His Spirit in us, we say, Abba, Father. I know that according to Romans chapter number 8, but let me tell you something. We're not to ever treat God as our buddy. 
We don't become so familiar in that sense that we treat God as our buddy. We're to reverence God. Let me give you some um, illustrations right here. If you will, um, let, me, let me take you over to 2 Samuel chapter 6. Hold your place in Joshua. Every time I go through Joshua chapter 3 and 4, there are so many lessons that we glean from this particular portion of Scripture. Uh, talking about treating things lightly that God says take seriously. If you'll notice in 2 Samuel chapter 6 and verse number 7. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against, it's either Uzzah or Uzzah. Uzzah is what I've heard all my life. Uzzah. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah. And God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. Now, most of you know what this is. You know the setting of this. What did Uzzah do? The, the oxen were carrying the ark down to Jerusalem. David wanted it carried. And the, the oxen went over a bump and the, the wagon rattled. And Uzzah put his hand out to steady the ark. And what did God do? God killed him. Yes, sir. As a heart attack, <laughs> he was sincere. He was so sincere, he was really trying to help. Cain was sincere when he brought his fruits to the ground, but God did not accept them. You don't treat, you don't treat God like your buddy. You had your hand up, Kurt. The ark, wasn't supposed to be carried that way. the ark was never supposed to be carried that way. It was supposed to have staves and the priests, the, high, the, uh, the Levites were supposed to carry it. And it was not to be touched only but by... And even the, 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 the Levitical, uh, the, the Levites, the priests, couldn't just put their hands on the ark. They had to put the staves through the rings and carry it on their shoulders. Now, do you think, you say, all of this, is it that, is it that important? Must have been, as I died, God smote him. See, treating lightly the things that God says you better take seriously. Right. See, there's a good lesson there, isn't there? Well, there's another one I want to read to you out of 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Turn over there. Now we had Uzzah. Well, here's King Uzziah. In verse 16 of 2 Chronicles chapter 26. When Uzziah was strong, when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. Well, he's king. He can do anything he wants. I mean, isn't that the, that's a, that's a thought. That's a predominant thought. Well, he can do anything he wants. He's king. And Azariah, verse 17, the priests went in after him and with him four score priests of the Lord. Eighty more priests went with him that were valiant men. And they withstood Uzziah the king and said to him, It appertaineth not unto thee, Uzziah, to burn incense unto the Lord, but to the priests, the sons of Aaron, that are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for thou hast trespassed, neither shall it be for thine honor from the Lord God. Then Uzziah was wroth. He, was, he got very angry at the priest. And he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priest, the leprosy even rose up to his forehead before the priest in the house of the Lord from beside the incense altar. And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked upon him. And behold, he was leprous in his forehead. And they thrust him out. You know he was a leper till he died. Why? Because he treated lightly the thing he should have taken seriously. Only the priests were allowed to burn incense. Only the priests were allowed. Uh, if you'll read Amos, um, the, um, they, uh, they took of the lowest and made them priests in Bethel in the altars that they'd set up in Bethel and Dan. You know, I believe that's what people are doing today in churches. It's pick a preacher. Just pick a preacher. It don't matter who it is. Just pick one. He'll, you know, I mean, put a, put a coat and tie on him and give him a good haircut and Teach him to say the right words. Even the haircut doesn't seem to matter much anymore. 
No, well, it doesn't. But just, just you know, just, just put him in. You know, we need to treat reverently the things that God said is reverent. God is reverent. He is, we should revere him. And we should not treat lightly the things that he says to take seriously. This word is not to be mishandled. It's, and when the, when the man of God opens the Bible and begins to read it, it should be, thus saith the Lord. It should be, thus saith the Lord. And not our own contaminated ideas and opinions. Amen? All right. So anyway, God, um, God wants us to treat, again, seriously what he said to take seriously. Do not treat them lightly. All right. So we have Joshua. We have the message of the priest to the people. Then we have, uh, in verse 5, we have Joshua's message to the people. The Bible said, Joshua said to the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Now, here is an order and a promise. An order and a promise. Now, the order was to sanctify yourselves. The fulfillment of the promise depended upon the obedience to the order. What if they didn't sanctify themselves? You see, there's some things that we talked about here a couple of Wednesday nights ago. Some things are conditional. Some are unconditional. Um, as, far as, as far as the blessings of God being bestowed upon you. Now, I know that God's going to um, bless you. He reigns on the just and the unjust. So I'm not going to argue that point. But I am going to tell you what verse number 5 says. He said, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. What if they didn't sanctify themselves? What if they did not follow the order of the Lord and let the priest go in the waters? And, the, and what would have happened? I guarantee it wouldn't have happened like this. So there's some things that we need to follow. Uh, meeting these conditions, again, we're not earning favor or blessings, but we're making sure our hearts are ready for the blessings of God. You can look at Jonah to find this principle to be true. You can look at Nehemiah to find this principle to be true. Several places in the Word of God, God says, you do it like this, this is what I'm going to do. If you don't do it like this, this is what I'm going to do. He told Jonah, if they would turn, then I will bless and they will not die. If they don't turn, they're going to die in three days. There's some conditional and unconditional promises in the Word of God. All right? All right, so we see the message to the people in verse number five. The Bible says, sanctify yourselves and tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. You know what I want? I want all the blessings of God. The Bible says that we have all spiritual blessings. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places according to Ephesians chapter number one, verse number three. I want them all. I want to claim them all. I, I do want them all. I have in times past not claimed them all. Do I want them all? Yes, I do. So what am I going to do? What are you going to do? We're going to get in the Bible and do it God's way. I want everything he has. I've never been this way before. It's 2018, and I want all of the blessings for the Faith Baptist Church. I, want all, I don't want any curses on my finances. I don't want any misfortunes and trials going on at the Faith Baptist Church unnecessarily. Did you get that? Now, I know they're going to come, trials and trouble, but I don't want to be the one that creates them. Some things we're going to have to do, conditionally and unconditionally, sanctify yourselves. All right, then we have the message to the priest in verse number 6. Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. All right, simply this, the presence of the Lord should go before us. Um, Look at Revelation chapter. Hold your place there. Look at Revelation. I, it's the presence of the Lord. There's another good nugget and lesson. The presence of the Lord should always go before us. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. John the Apostle in verse 10 said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me. A great voice as of a trumpet. Look at verse 12 and 13. 
And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned, he was facing the right direction now. If you hear something behind you, you're in the wrong place. You need to get in the other place. Amen. You need to make sure the Lord, you say, is that what that's saying? That's a good lesson. That's a good lesson. Amen. The Bible says, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about with paps of the golden girdle. Now, we know who it was. It was the Lord Jesus Christ. He should always be in the front. God is not your co-pilot. Remember those license plates that were popular back in the 60s and 70s? Well, some of you don't even remember the 60s and 70s. Amen. But he is our pilot. He's not our co-pilot. And he's not your buddy. He's God. Amen. He's God. All right. So we see the message of the priest there, the Lord's presence going before us. And then we see the message of the Lord to Joshua in verse seven and eight. The Lord said unto Joshua, this day will I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And thou shalt command the priests that bear the ark of the covenant, saying, When ye are come to the brink of the water of Jordan, ye shall stand still in the Jordan, or in Jordan. God was telling Joshua that he would cause the people to know that God had given Joshua a position of authority and leadership. Now, I've spent a little time on that last Wednesday. Sometimes verse number seven can be difficult. Why? Because we get to thinking that we're better than we really are, than we really are. And when that happens, you know what it's going to happen? You're going to take a fall. You're going to take a fall. You get a reputation sometimes, if you're not careful, that exceeds your ability. Yeah, that's a dangerous place to be. You get a reputation that exceeds your ability, and somewhere along the way, you're going to fall on your face. But I can't stop there. When I do fall, who, who is always there to help me back up? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's, he's, he's always there. So we see the message of the Lord to Joshua. Look at verse 9 through 13. We see Joshua's message to the people. Joshua's message to the people. Verse number 9, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby ye shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Jebusites, and all them other sites. Amen. That's what we just say them all. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth passeth over before you into Jordan. Now therefore take you twelve men out of the tribes of Israel, out of every man out of every tribe of man, and it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the ark of the Lord. The Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. So we see the message of Joshua to the people. Joshua magnified the Lord. He focused the eyes of God's people on the Lord and his greatness. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to what? Magnify thee. You know, you know that God will magnify you when God knows that you're going to magnify Him. That's true. When you're going to magnify Him. Joshua magnified the Lord. What Joshua did as a leader was focus the eyes of God's people on the Lord and His greatness. Not Himself, but the Lord. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 34, verse number 3, O magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. That was a theme, and hopefully and prayerfully it'll stay our theme in 2018. In, Josh, in Psalm chapter number 40 and verse number 16, the Bible said, The Lord be magnified. What a message that is. John the Baptist said in John chapter 3 and verse number 30 that he must increase and I must decrease. Did you have your hand up? When you read that verse, I was just identifying with it. I got this lady using that verse. 
Amen. Let us magnify the Lord together. That was his proposal. A hundred years. I mean, uh, Miss Donnell, was, that was only 10 years ago. <laughs> Amen. I got to cover myself up here. Amen. All right. Yeah. Amen. Brother, I tell you what, let us magnify the Lord together. What a proposal that is. Let's you and I together. Let's you and I here at the church magnify the Lord together. Let's, let's, let's magnify the Lord together. So after looking at all of these messages that we looked at, these five messages, you see the Lord gave Israel the information that they needed, gave them the leader they needed, gave him the wisdom he needed to accomplish what he wanted them to do. God has never called you to do anything or ask you to do something that he didn't provide the necessary means for you to do it. Think about that. God's never took you down a blind path. Never. He's always given you what you needed to go forward. And that's what he tells us to do. Go forward by faith. Go forward by faith. I'm not asking you to step out blindly. I'm going to send the ark before you. And I'm going to put the priests in there and their feet's going to go in the water. And it's going to part. And there's going to be a wall on the right and a wall on the left. You're going to go forward on dry ground. You're going to pick up some stones and you're going to put them over there in Gilgal. And you're going to build an altar. Why? For a memorial. For a memorial. You see, God's commandments are still his enablements. But did you know we can't leave? We're talking about the witness of faith. The witness in chapter 4 is that memorial that they built in testimony of how God brought them over the Jordan on dry ground to, uh, to claim the land, their inheritance they gave him. We have a memorial. It's right here in front of us. We have a memorial that tells us that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, why don't you claim them? We have this to look at to believe it's true or to prove it's true. Well, what about the stones in the river? You ever thought about that in chapter 4? I don't have time to go over it right now. But in chapter number 4, only God could see the stones in the river. Only God. The men couldn't see them, so really it wasn't a memorial for the men. But God told him to put 12 stones and he caused the Jordan River to, to, to come back and it covered the stones. You know, I have a good answer, I think, for that is that only God could see those stones and the old life was buried. The old life was buried. And I use that with Romans chapter 6 about the old man. Amen. We're raised to walk. We, we, we died. We died once with Christ. We're buried with Christ. And we're raised to do what? Walk in newness of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. So the twelve stones in the midst of the river witnesses that God honors faith. I believe that's what it is. Amen. Let's, I'm done. I'm done for tonight. Let's stand our feet. We'll be dismissed. All right. Is everybody happy? Amen. You're going to go forward.